So the Intel 10 core CPU is out. We've got a special CPU report from Computex, but that's not out yet. But it will be, so stay tuned. Yes, Computex was absolutely a blast. Uh, I think this is actually, um, I wouldn't say it was the best, uh, you know, the best uh, Computex we've ever had. I think last year, I think so far is is uh, the one that takes the cake because we were we were kind of all over the place. But I think everybody being there and kicking ass. And uh, next year, next year is going to be the best one we ever do. That's uh, that's my my like, statement. I'm sticking to. I it. like this year. I think I like this year better than last year, honestly, because this year there were a lot more people. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I, you're right. I think co the Computex experience itself, I think uh, are, there is, you know, I, I look at it from so many different angles. Both the, the, the experience of being at Computex and also the, uh, just, just everything that happens, uh, you know, with, with us, we had, you know, we had the, the editor, or I'm sorry, we had our new camera guy uh, hanging out with us the whole time. That was a lot of fun. I mean, it was actually nice to have, like, you, you're the cameraman, you don't have to think about it at all. It was... Um, it was it was pretty pretty amazing. So next year, next year I think is going to be the best one ever. It's my my goal. Make that one make next year better than this year. That's what we got. So we, let's uh, let's get this thing started. Um, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, there's a bunch <laughs> of coverage. A lot Go. Of, a lot, awful lot of news we're having this week. Yeah. So the news. The, the news this week. If you have a Twitter account, go and change your password. There, there's the news. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Oops. 32 million accounts. Compromise. You know what's really awesome? I, uh, I found uh, one of these. Uh, you can go to leaked source, and they'll, they'll, you can put in your, your Twitter account, and it'll tell you if your account's been compromised. I did that, and um, mine's not. I'm not important enough to get compromised yet. That doesn't give you guys no it's ideas. Easy. Well, it, it's uh, so it's probably the case that Twitter wasn't actually compromised. It was probably MySpace and LinkedIn. So what happens when there are these major breaches is that they sort of happen in clusters because um, whenever the passwords have been leaked, you know they're sort of floating around. Or the you know maybe the hashed passwords or maybe the encrypted passwords have been leaked, um, but sort of leaked secretly, and then somebody has you know had dozens of machines trying to brute force the passwords for a while now, and then they figured out the passwords, and so they put it into one big list, and so it's released under the internet, but it's not clear if people reuse the same password, and so like if you just take a random sampling of the you know 50 or 60 million people from LinkedIn that were compromised and you try that same password account with those email addresses on Twitter, a significantly high percentage of those accounts will work on Twitter. And it's like, hmm, that's probably not good. So this may be compiled from multiple lists where people never change their Twitter password for years and years and years. Uh, and so that would be a problem. So just go change your Twitter password just because it's good practice to change it every so often, make it complicated, make it completely unlike whatever it used to be. That'd be good. And then, you know, don't don't write it down and put it on a sticky note on your computer and then take a picture of it and post that to Twitter because that would be kind of dumb. D don't do that. I've seen someone actually do that and you're like, God. <laughs> and of course, there. I've seen people accidentally tweet their credit cards before, so it's just like, uh, oops. I'm not sure what's worse when you watch somebody accidentally tweet their credit card or when they go purposely go, oh my God, look at my new credit card, it's so amazing, and you're like, did you really <laughs> just do that? Look at the cool picture on this one. Hey, check out the back. You got that cool number on the back too. It's like, what are you, what are you doing? It's like you just want to <laughs> smash someone in the face. And I don't, I don't. Yeah, I don't, I don't get these people. Don't do that, ever. Ever. <laughs> it's like I don't know. So it's uh, some other things. This okay. So the next one, uh, this next article, I I found like jaw droppingly amazing. And I was uh, I was hanging out in San Francisco, and I was actually talking to. Uh, I was talking to one of our members. I was hanging out with him, and he works with uh, some some of the medical uh, stuff down in in San Fran and some of the the schools down there, and then some of the people that actually make uh, prosthetics. Uh, and this next article is talking about prosthetic arms that are actually inspired by Deus Ex. So they their goal was to create a basically Adam Jensen's arm, 
in a form of a prosthetic that the, the, the mechanics are already there, but not to the extent that it's Adam Jensen's arm, but they just wanted to make it aesthetically look like that, which I thought was pretty awesome. Cause I'm like, I saw this and I'm like, do I really want to go chop off my arm yet? No, not, not yet. Technology is not quite where I want it to be. <laughs> Um, but they got some pretty cool prosthetics think, uh, coming out. I, th I think that prosthetics have to be a lot more squishy because it's hard to go wrong with the squishiness. I don't think I want, you know, even a carbon fiber prosthetic. I'm going to need some kind of artificial squishy prosthetic because it's just, <laughs> there's there's too much sensory information that you get from that. And the fact that everything kind of gives a little bit and there's not any kind of rigid joints, I think, work pretty well. Uh, in human beings' favor, just because they're they tend to be kind of clumsy, but uh, you know, uh, PingoCon, not this past year, but the year before that, they were doing 3D printed prosthetics, and it was uh, the same kind of mindset. It was like there were it was for children that were you know were growing, and it was like, look, it doesn't make a lot of sense for families to spend thirty thousand dollars on a prosthetic that's going to be good for their their kids for six months or a year as they're growing. So maybe 3D printing is a way to deal with that. And so the charity that the PinguinCon was working with was doing lots of different, they did like Captain America and Hulk and Iron Man, 3D printed prosthetics, the designs for that. And I thought that was pretty interesting and clever. Yeah, one of the things about prosthetics in general is that they are, you, you know, one-time use. It's like you, you get, well, I say one-time use. It's one uh, one person use. You can't just make a, a slew of prosthetics for, for everybody. They, they, they craft it for that individual. Uh, and you have to have, I think, there's, I think there's only like two schools in the country where there's a degree program that allows you to be the doctor of the prosthesis, whatever, uh, to a point where that person is allowed to actually fit a patient with a prosthetic and they have to go through the whole, I mean, there may be other doctors that are involved that are actually making it, but there has to be this one doctor that has that one degree that a lot, that actually goes in and fits it to the patient. And that does like a whole line of, of science that goes behind that, which I was like, this is, this is amazing. There's so much, so much cool stuff in the world. I'm really excited. I just want to meet the person who's do, who's going to have one of these and then I'm going to make them punch through a wall. That's what I wanted to do. Because that's that's where the non-squishy part comes in. You're like, how else are you gonna punch through a wall? Because the robot arm, man, it's cybernetics. <laughs> My hand made it through the wall, but the connecting bone and sinew, not so much. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. And then you pull it back out, and you leave the arm in the wall, and you're like, crap, that didn't uh, didn't stay attached like it was supposed to. Ah, uh, so much. I don't know. There's so much going on. This stuff is this stuff is amazing. I, I'm really, really kind of excited about uh, about that. So I'm, I'm I can't wait to to see that in action. Uh, it's gonna be cool. I'm gonna continue with these non segue segues and uh, move on to the EU is exploring the ideas, the idea of using government ID cards as potential online logins. Uh, I'm just gonna let you run with this because I We've I'm kind of speechless. <laughs> it's like. Why would you do such a thing? <laughs> it's like the magic is a uh, driver's license for the internet. That's that's where this has come up before. It's like, do we need a driver's license for the internet? And the answer is no, we don't. No, and, and the reason why we don't is I'm going to go right back to 32 million Twitter passwords on the dark web. Imagine if that was your login, was your government ID. So then it was like, oh well, now your ID is 32 million IDs that are just floating around and. Man, we could totally Photoshop my face onto somebody else's ID, and I could be, uh, I could be Jack Sparrow. That's what I'd be. <laughs> it's those subtle attacks on anonymity. Well, they could do chip and pin. I mean, chip and pin would be, you know, a challenge response kind of a deal, and so that would be a lot harder to compromise versus, you know, the whole Twitter password thing. And honestly, chip and pin, as run by the user, probably wouldn't be a bad idea. I mean. Uh, chip and pin, especially where this when the site that you're on. I, actually, you know, it's really funny. Uh, uh, client side certificates is totally a thing. It is actually really easy to do client side encryption certificates without a smart card, but that it ties to a specific browser. It's as far as web technologies go, it is trivially easy um, to implement that. I think uh, Mega experimented with that. Mega the the site, and there are some sites like Salesforce.com that will do that. And so, if you don't have the client side certificate, it will. Uh, sort of be like, hey, this computer's not authorized, even though you're using the same username and password. So it goes into the, like the whole two-factor thing, and that's not actually terrible. It's just that 
uh, nobody's made an easy to use framework to actually use that. And so the closest analog is like a smart card or chip and pin. Um, and I, I get to, <laughs> I've had to do a lot with chip and pin as it turns out. Um, and chip and pin is not a bad idea, but trying to shoehorn that into some kind of government ID, uh, that's kind of, that's, mm, uh, I don't think this is a good idea. I mean, you know, <laughs> nobody thought it was a big deal to put that they were Jewish on census forms in the Netherlands, and IBM was like, hey, let's help with that. And that was in, you know, the early 1900s, and that turned out to be a bad idea. Yeah, just a little bit. I, I'm totally not... I don't know. I've I've got you know you get U.S. passport, you get your license. What happens if you you change you know, you move? Well, I guess this is for the EU. But I mean, what happens if you move? Do you do you have to update your login credentials with your new ID? I mean, how does this work? It's <laughs> it's like crap. I you mean, have here to in the be states, able to be rated by jackbooted thugs at any time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I mean, like imagine uh, imagine yeah, imagine if you move states. You get your new ID and suddenly you're locked out of all your stuff because your new ID is not the same as your old ID. And, and then we're like, oh, well, then you're just going to have to get a passport card or we're going to get into one, you know, one uh, universal ID. And the, 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 this just opens up a can of worms. No. I'm just, there we go. No. Let's move on to something a little more sinisterly hilarious. Like the 41 Secret Service employees punished for illegally accessing congre congressman's private data in hopes of discrediting him. I just want to read that. This is just the headline. I just want to read that again because this is amazing. 41 Secret Service employees. So these are all technically Secret Service agents, whether or not they're the, you know, they're not on presidential duty. They might have been. They're not the, uh, the, the you know, POTUS has landed. You know, none of that. But they were punished for illegally accessing a congressman's private data in hopes of discrediting him. Is this not abuse of the system uh, we need a, in and We need a new segment. Well, the, the new segment should be like uh, government employees using ham-fistedly using technology badly. I don't know some 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 much shorter and more clever name for government employees doing terrible things. I mean, this is it's like watching an ape with a speaking spell. Just you know, can you imagine if people were slightly more uh, literate with technology when it came to doing this kind of thing? Because you know, clearly there's enough of a monoculture inside the Secret Service that 57 people would do this and had it not been had it not gone so wrong publicly uh i gotta really wonder uh how they would have been punished i mean clearly they're using they're abusing the access that they have uh as a result of their position and i'm looking at the summary of the uh the punishment here and the, the punishment really just doesn't seem just doesn't really seem that severe uh to me but well we here's thought we'd mention it because it's funny here's my question this isn't the first time they've done this. This is just the first time they were caught in such a public fashion. We, we, we all know that this, this is not, this isn't like, oops, yeah, we did this this one time, my bad. Now this is, how many other times have they done this? How many other people have they done this to? I, you know, what, where does, how deep does the rabbit hole go? Well, yeah. there are three classes of people. Congressmen, regular US citizens, and non-U.S. citizens. And so if this is happening to congressmen, what hope does the average citizen have? And also, you people in the EU, uh, I just, I don't know what we're doing with your data, but it's probably really bad. And that doesn't even stop with the EU. I mean, that goes, the EU, uh, it's going to be anything coming in and out of China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, Russia, especially Russia. I mean, in all reality, if any data goes in and out of the U.S., uh, the U.S. is tracking it. Not that we're not tracking everything inside the U.S. anyway, but if it goes out of the U.S. in any way, shape, or form, like if if you're here and you're you're a I used to work for a British company in New York, and a couple of my uh, fellow employees, we were kind of laughing one day. He's like, "Yeah, you can look this up," but the moment I look that kind of thing up, I'm suddenly on. You know, I'm I'm getting more scrutinized because I'm that the British foreigner. I'm I'm the legal alien, sure, but I'm still the foreigner. I'm the I'm the British guy. And that can get me deported. It's like, oh well, that's fantastic. Let's let's move on to something a little uh, a little less depressing, shall we? <laughs> like, what is it? you you tell me about this? Maru uh, is now public at zero point two point three. Uh, give get, I was looking over this and I thought this was kind of awesome. But go ahead and, and give us give us the, the 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 simple overview and then what and why is this important? 
Okay, so this is an interesting project that's worth looking at. Uh, you guys may have heard us talk about, I'm going to segue for a second, but you guys may have heard us talk about Microsoft Continuum, which is a project that Microsoft has shown off a few times where they're trying to sort of blur the lines between a phone, a laptop, and a desktop. And I think if I understand the vision of Continuum properly, it is that you're running an application with data and open documents on your phone, and then you sit down at your laptop, and you basically just swipe the application from your phone to your laptop, and the application continues running on your on your on your laptop. Or maybe you sit down at a desktop, and you swipe the application from your desktop to your you know desktop computer. It's t it's sort of taken a little a little different um, manifestation for the first version, which is you know you dock your phone, and then your phone sort of becomes a desktop computer because you can use your uh, keyboard, mouse, and that kind of thing. We saw some some hardware to go with Continuum at Computex, which was really exciting because it sort of signals that, hey, Continuum's not quite vaporware. But Maru is an open source version of that, and so Maru is sort of the open source take on that, and they may have beat Microsoft to the punch on some of the features of Continuum. And so it's uh, now available for anyone with a Nexus 5, and so you can put the Linux image on this, and it's sort of a hybrid phone Linux desktop. So it does the Continuum type stuff where you can use your phone as a desktop computer, but you can still use your phone as an actual functional phone. So if you plug your phone into a bunch of peripherals, then all of a sudden it acts like a desktop computer and you can run desktop Linux applications. Or you can uh, you know, run phone stuff and phone applications on it as well because it's still, it's still a Nexus 5, but it's a different operating system. Yeah, I was looking at this and I, my first thought was, well, yeah, no, my first thought was, will this work on the Nexus 7 with the cellular radio in it because that was one of the big annoyances that I've got the I've got the I've got a Nexus 7 with the with the the LTE radio and it doesn't actually act like a phone and I'm like why not it should totally be able to act like a phone as long as I put like a phone sim chip in there it should be good to go it's the same same operating system with this I would be very interested because they said they haven't they haven't uh, they haven't done it yet uh, but they're, they're focusing on the Nexus 5 and then I think the next generation or the the, the next goal that they're looking at is putting it on the Nexus 7 and any of the Nexus devices and then expanding it. And it's, it's open source, so if you wanted to get a hold of this and try to make it work for your phone, knock yourself out. It's, it's there, it's, it's available, it's open source. <laughs> if only we knew some talented people that could make videos and put them on YouTube to demo this damn thing. Hmm. I'll make a few <laughs> phone calls. <laughs> I know a few people. Uh, yeah. So I. Turtle Beach now. I don't have a Nexus Five. You don't have a Nexus Five? No. I've, I, <laughs> actually, you know what's really funny? My Nexus Seven, I think, is actually in one of these boxes back here. It's it's buried because I I still haven't I haven't been in my apartment long enough to actually sort through some of these boxes. I'm like, oh, it sits in there. So I'm still technically unpacking. <laughs> here we are. I've been here since February and I'm still unpacking. It's like, damn it. And then I get stuff like this. I'm going to get some of these. I want to get some of these, and I want to turn this into my, my windows. So the Turtle Beach announces the new Hypersound glass, uh, which kind of blew my mind a little bit. And it's, it's it, what is it? It's, it's vibrating the glass to create uh, sound. I, 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 like, I looked over this, Turtle and I was Beach. just a little now blown there's away. there's a name that I haven't heard in, in a long like while. 10 years. <laughs> yeah, the, the Turtle Beach made the really amazing... ISA sound cards that gave Sound Blaster cards a run for their money. I mean, you know, Creative was kind of resting on their laurels, and Turtle Beach was like, hey, what's up? We're Turtle Beach. We've got, you know, high-precision DAC and precision clock references, and it was like, holy crap, these are amazing. The drivers were a little bit of a pain in the ass to get working in games, and so and it's like Turtle Beach shows up and is like, oh, we got glass speakers now. It's like, wow, there's a, there's a blast from the past. Look at those things. I'm I'm really kind of stoked about this. I really want to. You know what? I don't want to put this in my like my window. I want to make this car uh, a car window. I want to put this in a car, and I just want to make it so I can I can hit a button and just blast sound out of my car to like everybody else. But I'm like completely isolated on the inside. Can't hear anything. Just blasting it. So this is E3. So it'll be interesting to see if anybody covers this from E3. Yeah, that'd be pretty neat. Broadwell E arrives. You said we've got some. We've got a video. No, we, Lord, no. Linus doesn't even have his. I saw him tweet that, you know, it's like, oh, no one sent us one. And it's like, hey, <laughs> welcome to the cheap seats. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> we did pick up a Broadwell, Z Broadwell E Xeon uh, because 
at seventeen hundred and twenty-three dollars, uh, <laughs> Broadwell Ezeon is probably a better deal, unless you plan on getting a stable overclock of you know four to four point five gigahertz. Um, but we've been working with some people in the industry and gathering data um, from different manufacturers that that you know we're in touch with, and we always ask for information from all the different major vendors, you know, like Gigabyte and ASRock and Asus and stuff, because they get tons of, of CPUs from Intel. And it's like, hey, uh, you know, what's your average overclock that you're seeing? What's the voltage? Do you have an overclock guide? And they, all those companies always have some kind of intelligence they can share with us. And based on their reports, uh, you know, it's <laughs> the situation with Broadwell E is that 4.3 gigahertz is, is a common overclock. 4.5 gigahertz is a rare overclock. Um, Intel sort of at the factory uh, pre-bends these things, and one of your 10 cores is selected as the quote-unquote best overclocking core. And when you have a single-threaded workload, that's the CPU that hits, you know, 4.0 gigahertz on the turbo. Uh, but we picked up a Xeon 2687W, because, hey, if we're going to spend $1,700 on a CPU, it's not going to be a desktop part. Um, and that CPU is uh, 3 gigahertz with a turbo up to 3.5, but it's 12 cores instead of 10, 30 megs of cache instead of 24. But even for single-threaded workloads, having more L2 cache generally uh, is almost as good as having about 5 more megs of cache. The last time we did this with the V3 CPUs, 5 more megs of cache worked out to be a, 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 about as beneficial as 400 megahertz or so more on the clock side and so it'll be interesting We're, i'm hoping that we can get our hands on a loner uh broadwell e cpu borrow one from somebody for a while and uh and do that head to head because otherwise it's going to be really funny i mean how how hilarious is the news coverage going to be of that where it's like hmm xeon 2687w 12 core versus broadwell e 10 core and it's like hey we got the next cpu that's going to be out in 18 months from uh you know socket 2011 v3 and uh it's the 12 core instead of the 10 core because you know we moved from eight to from eight to 10 cores just now should have just bought the 10 core xeon because those have been available for like forever rather than wait on on broadwell e seventeen hundred dollars what is wrong with intel oh my god why is it so much i'm sorry i'm rambling it's just i can't believe it's seventeen hundred dollars but we've got coverage from computex from the intel booth from the intel press event of that and more so that'll be more comprehensive be sure to check out our computex coverage so uh now the one thing about the the the, the Xeon chips that I, if I remember correctly, most of them are only like 1.8 all the way up to like 2.6, 2.7 gigahertz. I mean they they're not they're not boosting up beyond that. They're not they're not really going any faster. They're they're pretty steady uh, mid mid uh, you know mid two gigahertz range. Well, it's it depends on the core count. So Intel nerfs the CPU speed. If when the core count is high for the 2687w it's three gigahertz out of the box just like the uh, 6950x uh, but it turbos to 3.5 instead of 4.0 so the broadwell e 6950x will turbo to 4.0 on one core uh, but the xeon doesn't quite turbo that high and I don't, i'm not sure if the xeon is locked i imagine it is uh, but it remains to be seen if the uefis that we have implement the um base clock overclocking restriction because I'm pretty sure I can hit 112 megahertz on that Xeon uh, all day long which would push us well past 4 gigahertz uh, on the 2687W front but 3.5 turbo out of the box on that 2687V4 is not too shabby and that's 12 core not 10 I'm pretty excited I can't wait to get now all if you get like one of the 22 core parts the 22 core parts are like $5,000 and they're like 2.2 gigahertz yeah but you know it's those are for data centers and people that are running virtualization loads. Lots and lots and lots. And of in Computex, we loads. saw the new Xeon socket, which is much bigger and designed for like those massive forty-four core CPUs that are not out yet. It's a lot of cores. It's a lot of cores. Learn how much. Those things can draw a lot of power. Anyway, we're gonna move along. I, I keep laughing because every single time I click on this article, uh, it I, I am like, why why do we have Baphomet on our on our screen, and it's uh, this is the hacking tool that swipes <laughs> encrypted credentials from password manager. I'm just like that graphic. I'm like, I don't even want to read the article. I'm just going to sit here and look at this picture for a while because that's that's hilarious. Because I know what I know what this picture normally is depicted as, but the the fact that the lock is sitting in his lap, and I'm just like, 
Is that like supposed to be his chastity belt or something? Key I don't pass. Know. It's a key pass, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Well, this is just a friendly reminder that uh, your key pass is one of the best password managers, but password managers do not help you if the machine that the password manager is on is compromised. And so a tool has been created called Key Farce that if there's a bad guy that has remote access to your machine and they run Key Farce and you use Key Pass, they'll be able to dump all of the stuff from Key Pass. Now, if you, have, if you just happen to have your file and somebody gets your file, then your file is still encrypted, it's still safe. But if the machine that you're running Key Pass on is compromised, Key Farce will allow them to uh, remove stuff. Now, Key Pass does take steps to like scramble stuff in memory and, and that kind of thing to try to prevent processes from like stealing it through memory. This particular one uses DLL injection. This is not a problem specific to Key Pass. This is, a, this is any kind of problem that you would have where some foreign person controls your machine. It's pretty much over at that point. But this is making the news and circulating and, and that kind of thing. Plus, it's just a fun way for us to mention KeePass. KeePass is a good password manager if you want to have complex passwords. You know, we were talking about the Twitter stuff earlier. KeePass is a pretty good program. And uh, you shouldn't be afraid of key farce because if, if your machine's compromised in this way, you have other problems. Would you, uh, would you recommend getting like a, like a USB drive and putting a copy of your, your password database on that? And maintaining it on a on a removable drive. I mean, uh, granted, of course, that random moment where you leave it in the wash and suddenly you lose all your passwords because you destroy your your flash drive. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is a call to developers uh, in in the audience. I think um, write an extension or a plugin, and this may exist. I don't know for KeePass uh, because uh, one of your old Android phones completely offline disable the radio. Use that as your password manager. It's air gapped. But then it becomes inconvenient to actually type your password. So what I want you to do is implement a, a QR code thing so that in KeePass you can just tap it and then you can hold your phone up to the webcam on your computer. And then the, the key pa key password keeping software on your computer would read the QR code and type it into whatever text box you have selected. So that, that's maybe a browser extension plus a plug-in for KeePass or something like that. Write that and then we'll talk. That'd be kind of neat. I mean, because I know that there's a couple of software yeah, that... Uh, that Logan and I use, where you've got uh, you want to log into the web page. The web page pops up with a QR code, and you've actually got the app on your phone that will suddenly kick in and say, "Hey, you're trying to log into your computer. Uh, scan the QR code on the computer with your phone," and and that, that's built in. But that's that's requiring an app on the phone, and it would require your phone not to be air gapped. So that. Uh, yeah, you're basically creating the inverse of that. Do that. Somebody do that. That'd be great. Now, you just sent this one to me. I didn't get a chance the, to look at this. Go ahead. There, well, there's an HP 100LX Palm Top computer behind me that may or may not have uh, Bitcoin wallets and things like that on it. And that is a, uh, it has a 5 megabyte flash card. 5 megabytes, not gigabytes. And uh, it's an 80186. And so I think that's reasonably air gapped. There you go. <laughs> Is that it's a DOS like, computer with a Bitcoin wallet. How crazy is that? So we got to use like an old serial connector to get that thing. <laughs> How do you? No, it? no, it's uh, it's a, uh, it's got an infrared port, and so I can, I can do stuff through the infrared. It actually works pretty well. Oh, it's I know it's going to be something really fun like that. Can't, can't be something simple. It's got to be really. Yeah, no, there's, there's no way. You have to have an infrared reader and your software to be able to read. read uh, that's fantastic. Okay, you just sent me this before we started this. Uh, the, the telescope Z -modem. unveiled it. Z-modem is, oh. is the magic there. Z-modem is the magic <laughs> via the infrared port. All right, now what was the other thing? I forgot, sorry. <laughs> telescope unveiled at Hack in a Box. Oh, yeah, telescope. All right, so check okay, this out. You, you tell me about telescope this because I don't really know what this exciting, is. And I'll, all right, it's, it's really exciting. It's also horrifying. All right. So we talked about Heartbleed and, like, stealing your TLS keys and your encryption keys and things like that. Uh, if you, you know, lease a virtual machine from a provider like Linode or Amazon or Azure, as one is wont to do, um, these researchers put together a paper and they said, oh, crap, we think we figured out the other thing that the uh, intelligence agencies do to steal keys. Because, see, the Heartbleed thing was really it was really an insidious problem with encryption technology on the web so when you go to a secure website like amazon.com and it's 
HTTPS encrypted, um, Heartbleed allowed an attacker to steal a little bit of the server's memory at a time. And this was a really great way to surreptitiously uh, collect the encryption keys that were floating around memory. Uh, and so like the NSA could, in a very, you know, hypothetically, and I'm sure this was done, at least some, uh, use that exploit to slowly collect memory um, from target systems in order to get uh, the private keys used for, for encryption. And then they would be able to decrypt encrypted traffic without actually breaking the encryption protocol because the encryption protocols themselves are actually quite good. Uh, AES-256, uh, for example, uh, it, it, a, at a perfectly implemented um, AES-256 uh, that has, you know, like five or six uh, cycles uh, requires such a ridiculous amount of computation even just cycling a, a counter through 256 bits would require uh, more energy than, than our sun has left in its life. Uh, and, that's assuming <laughs> and that's assuming a perfectly efficient computer uh, or something astronomical like that. Bruce Schneier has a, has a quote on exactly how much computational horsepower is needed for that. And so all of these three-letter agencies breaking into stuff depends on weaknesses in the algorithm, not weaknesses in the math, and uh, generally, uh, certain kinds of math. And uh, so this exploit is really interesting. They've developed software that can run at the hypervisor level, meaning that it's running on the, on the bare metal hardware or like the Intel management engine or somewhere lower level like that. And it can passively collect all the encryption keys from all the virtual machines that are running on the real physical machine. And the virtual machines would have no way of knowing that anything bad happened. And so this is probably the new way uh, that intelligence agencies are collecting encryption keys and decryption keys in mass because they would just have to go to Microsoft and be like, hey, bake this into Hyper-V. We need it. And then they would just need a backdoor into, uh, you know, the Azure facilities. And then they're done. They don't have to do anything. Like, that. that's sort of a mass compromise that is still kind of protected from the Internet um, by the fact that, you know, the Azure data center, Microsoft data center, um, is physically isolated from the rest of the internet and the virtual machines are the things that are actually on the internet. Same with Amazon, same with, with other, you know, Linode or any other virtual machine provider. But this, this proof of concept was really scary how simple it really was to put this together. And so I feel almost certain that this has already been done by three-letter agencies and probably already out there in the wild. Great. So what you're saying is I need to move to Mars. <laughs> well, one of the uh, one of the one of the magical things that happened after the last Heartbleed thing is using session based keys. So you still have your private key on disk and that's used to start up the web server. But then every different client has a different set of keys. And so that's good that one set of keys won't just decrypt uh, every single thing that has gone out over the wire. Um, <laughs> so that's good, but uh, this is still really bad because surreptitious access to virtual machines um, remotely and undetectably uh, is sort of what an intelligence agency would love to have, but it's sort of bad for secure computing because if the NSA can do it, you know, so can the Russian intelligence machine or so can, you know, some other regime that is or Chinese or you know anybody <laughs> whoever whoever your enemy happens to be today I don't know yeah. uh, can do bad things and so that's really horrifying. Yeah, and if you want if you want to re reinforce the the scariness, uh, some people call him. I always get a chuckle because every single time this guy's name is mentioned, people are like some people call him a hero, some people call him a traitor. I'm like, dude, the guy he's, he was working at a company, he was doing some stuff, and now he's in Russia. Uh, there's, a, there's an episode of Vice on HBO. Uh, it's called State of Surveillance, and it actually talks to Edward Snowden, and uh, it goes over a bunch of little things that he's like, yeah, they're already doing this, they're already doing that. Like, your phone, it's, it doesn't belong to you. If it gets hacked, it's owned, owned by somebody else, whoever hacked it. That's who owns your phone now. You're just a user, uh, which is like, oh, that's a good... Thank you for <laughs> making that so plain as day. Uh, just go and watch that. That's a, it's a great little video. It's only... Um, you might oh, it's loud. It's only uh, it's only 26 minutes long, so that's all good. But yeah, check it out. It's a good time. And speaking of uh, <laughs> speaking of encryption, uh, things that the the three letter agencies are doing, and uh, our favorite web browser Tor, uh, according to.
according to this, uh, Bitcoin miners or Bitcoiners who are using Tor, uh, you might be roped into criminal uh, based on the fact that the FBI really just is like, you know what, you use Tor, you're a criminal. That's how we're going to classify you. It's not even so much that they're going to say that you're a criminal. It's that they're going to treat you like you've done something wrong, even if you haven't done anything wrong, if you're using Tor. It's like, oh, you went into that shady poker den in that, you know, that speakeasy. You didn't actually have to drink anything, but you were there, so you, uh, you're you going to be investigated by the FBI, and a, for lack of long and short of it. I yeah, love well, Tor. Well, the, the thing here is the new rule would allow the FBI to infect innocent people's computers with malware in order to investigate cybercrime, even if their only connection to the crime was that they're the victims. What could possibly go wrong? No idea. It's, yeah. And so apparently just using Tor is enough to meet that. And so it's like if the person uses Tor, the FBI is empowered to get a discrete warrant, meaning a secret warrant, that allows them to hack the computer and follow wherever the connection leads. In theory, with a single secret warrant, the agency could grab control of tens of thousands or millions of computers on a botnet. And given that they've demonstrated that they have no real understanding of, of technology or a keenly insidious and sinister understanding of technology, depending on, on which way you want to swing there, yeah, uh, that could be bad. And, See, and not just for U.S. citizens, but also, you know, citizens abroad. Now, one of the things that I want to go into here, it's not specifically Tor, by the way. They, they, the way they worded this was that it was really uh, any kind of virtual private network. And while we, you know, we, we suggest people using things like PIA or uh, Viper uh, or, you know, some of these other... Uh, VPN services. In all reality, those services, they're using the what we call a VPN technology, but you're basically acting and treating them like a proxy. But instead of just being like an HTTP proxy, so you're saying, oh, in order for me to get web bread, you know, in order for me to browse the web, go through this, you're sending all of your network traffic through it. Prior to that kind of uh, functionality, uh, you know, what was what was used commonly, uh, VPNs were used by businesses to have a internal network and then you'd have a user would go outside of that internal network and they would need to access uh, assets that were only available inside the network. So you'd create this you know, encrypted tunnel to go from there inside of this, uh, inside of the, your, your corporate network. And then you could access all your cool stuff and it was encrypted between that machine and the corporate network. And since it's a company owned machine, everything's all happy hunky dory. Uh, but this, uh, the other quote down here, it says, uh, uh, likewise, the, the change seemingly means that the limit on warrants is excused or yeah, excused in any instance where a virtual private network is set up. Banks, online retailers, communications providers, any businesses around the world that use VPNs technically would fall under this. Uh, this we, can, we can scout you out. Tor just happens to be the one. This article is kind of, oh, the, the title here is a little misleading. I'm like, why would you specifically say bitcoiners why why is it bitcoiners why isn't it just everybody is using tor suddenly you know you're all tor vpns well, this, any was, of them. this was an article on on bitcoin.com oh, so yeah. it was written for the bitcoin audience but the eff is also sounding the alarm here which is the reason that, that we mentioned it is that uh you know there's just we've, we've been reporting on this kind of stuff for years and if you look at historically where we've been reporting uh this thing is not stagnant this thing has momentum and it's getting worse and worse and worse we're it's like you know we, we've been saying a lot of the same kind of things for years but if you look at it it things are moving in a direction opposite uh critical thinking and reasoning <laughs> and that that direction is is historically has been very bad i mean there's not really a, an historical precedent because the technology that we have today is unlike technology that the world has ever seen but human nature is not uh is not there's not really anything new in human nature mm -hmm. and we've seen what human nature is capable of when the tools uh were a lot less sophisticated and as sophisticated as the tools are now and as problematic as human nature has been in the past uh this should concern everybody oh yeah uh, i it does uh, it I, I, I was kind of funny because we, we've got a couple of random threads that show up on our forums. People are like, hey, any criticisms about, you know, us texting again? So a lot of people were saying, like, man, you got to get the tinfoil hat stuff. You know, we use that tinfoil hat reference as kind of a joke. 
mainly because of the fact that the stuff we're referencing or like this, this is happening. This isn't like some fairy tale. This is really happening right now. And it, without, uh, you know, without this being brought to everyone's attention, without you guys reading these articles, without us talking about it, nobody knows about these things. And, and that's it's like when I hear about these, I'm like, they, they're like at surprise. It again. You're doing something illegal. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's not illegal today, but tomorrow, uh, you know, this I'm going to read this one last quote from the EFF in this article. And you guys can read through this because it's pretty crazy. Uh, they say, make no mistake, the Rule 41 proposal implicates people well beyond U.S. borders. This update expands the jurisdiction of judges to cover any computer user in the world who is using technology to protect their location privacy or is unwittingly part of a botnet. I'm going to put that again. Unwittingly bar part of a botnet. So if your computer is compromised and you're part of a botnet, uh, you're in trouble. Or you might, you might be investigated by the FBI just because your computer is doing something bad. Uh, so both people inside and outside of the United States should be equally concerned about this proposal. So this isn't just United States. This is, this is going to be global, if uh, if this goes through the way they've got it worded right now. Uh, and I want to light like finish this off on a little bit of a positive note. Uh, last article we got is talking about the Luma Room. Uh, it's a peripheral project, uh, projected illusions for interactive experiences. Basically, it's a uh, it's a projector and a camera that sits in like in your living room or, or in front of your computer so when you're playing a game uh, it will see the game and then it will project more stuff around uh, or on your walls and it's there's a whole lot of stuff that they're showing that this thing can do and I'm, I'm pretty excited I want to get a hold of one of these this looks really neat <laughs> it does look pretty mind-blowing I mean it looks really really neat I think I want to try that and just see see what it does to my sensory like, is it sensory overload? Is it distracting? What happens? I mean, because it, it's almost like you've got your your core television or your core monitor that's going to have uh, all of your you know your bright focused content, and then you're just going to have this ghosty imaging uh, everywhere around you in your room, right? you know, projected on the wall, which I think is pretty awesome. Uh, I like the one where it's like they're projecting the contents of the room, but then the the whole room like shakes or whatever that's that was really interesting that actually that that one made my brain hurt because uh anyway in that bit in this video they they show uh there's the tv in the middle of the room and then there's bookcases and whatnot and the projection actually is projecting an image of the room over top of the room and then as like uh you fire a gun in the game it creates like a shockwave effect out of it and like that that would make people lose their minds that's, that's what that's gonna Let's, uh, <laughs> that's it. I think I'm done. You done? Hey, 17th worst episode ever. Well, if you found this disappointing, go watch the Corsair episode of the tech. It was actually pretty good. It was brass. <laughs> I don't have any gaming news either. I really thought that I would. E3 is going on. There's a new trailer for Wolfenstein, the new Colossus, and a bunch of things happening at E3. We did not go to E3. So, yeah. Okay, bye.